Welcome to the NCRS Insider, bringing you into the NCRS world with your host, Steve Thaser. In today's episode, we are starting a long series on the correct restoration of a 1970 LT1 Corvette. Along the way, we'll be touching on almost every component of the car, talking about the numbers, the configurations, and the finishes that are correct for a 1970 Corvette. Although the focus will be on the LT1, we will also be discussing the standard Corvette for 1970 as well. There are a lot of similarities between early C3s, so these videos will be very beneficial for many model years. To start things off, we're going to be diving into the basic numbers for the car, where they are located and what they mean, so you can determine what is correct on your Corvette. If considering an NCRS restoration, these are the numbers you need to be looking at prior to purchasing your car to determine how challenging your restoration project might be. So let's get started. To do a correct NCRS restoration, the appropriate manual is a must. For our vehicle, we are using the 1970-72 6th edition. This is an excellent manual that has done very well. A shout out to Gary Bosselman, a veteran NCRS member, for putting together this excellent manual. In the manual, the descriptions of each component of the car are very detailed and easy to understand. There are extensive photos which are very helpful to visualize things. This is very detailed information all the way down to correct bolt configurations. We will be referring to the manual often throughout the series. Before we begin, let's talk about the car we are working with. This Corvette started off pretty rough and lacked a lot upon purchase. The frame had some major rust. The body had several areas of damaged fiberglass. Other areas of the body had significant Bondo. The wheels and tires were totally incorrect. The engine was out of a 1970 Caprice and there was not much for an interior. This is not what you'd want to start with when doing an NCRS restoration, but that was not my plan at the beginning. After doing two relatively minor NCRS restoration and obtaining top flight awards, the original intent with this project was to do a C3 chrome bumper resto mod. I was really looking for a body and a correct title, so this car fit the bill perfectly and was at a bargain price. The first course of action with this build was disassembly. It was at this point that I discovered something that would change the total direction of this build. What was that discovery? It was three small holes. Confused? Well, we will get back to that story a little later. Okay, let's look at some important numbers on the 1970 Corvette. Let's get started with the body paint and trim plate. The plate has some very important information on it, including the correct exterior color, interior color, and assembly date. The plate is a thin, unpainted steel and attaches to the driver's door pillar with two round aluminum pop rivets. Starting at the top of the plate, the word Chevrolet is embossed, followed by the body build date. The body build code consists of a letter and two numbers. This is the day that the body passed the station on the assembly line where the plate was installed. At this time, the body was painted, but it had no trim or wiring and was not mated to the frame. From the chart in the NCRS manual, you can decode the month. In 1970, production started late, so A is for January of 1970. In 1971 and 72, production started in the preceding year, so A represents August. For our project, the code is C18. The C represents March of 1970, and the 1-8 is the 18th day of the month. This date is important as it relates to other components of the car with specific dates. On the second line down on the left is the interior trim code. It consists of three numbers, which is the specific interior color code for the car. From the NCRS chart, you can determine the correct color and if the upholstery was vinyl or leather. Our number is 422 which makes it a green interior with vinyl upholstery. On the second line down to the right is the exterior color code. It also consists of three numbers, which is the specific exterior color code for the car. Back to the NCRS manual, the 982 on the trim plate represents Donnie Book Green, one of the popular colors for the 1970 model year. 
Now let's go to the VIN certification label, which is placed to the rear of the driver's door. The label was placed on the car when the assembly was fully completed. These are often missing since it is common during a repaint to remove the label. However, reproductions are available. The label is blue colored covered with a clear mylar. In the upper right corner of the label in typed letters is the month and year of production. At the bottom of the label, the VIN number is printed. Let's break down the first five digits of the VIN number and we will hit the rest later. The first digit is a one, which means it's a Chevrolet. The nine represents Corvette. The four means this was a V8 engine. And the last two digits determine whether it is a coupe or convertible. A 37 means it's a coupe. If we had a 67, that it would be a convertible. Next, we are going to look at the numbers on the engine block. One of the unfortunate things with our project car is the original engine is long gone and the engine in it was decoded to be from a 1970 Chevy Caprice. This was period correct and had the correct casting number, but date codes were off. A new engine block was found, which actually came out of a 1969 Corvette, so it fit the bill perfectly. The engine casting number is located at the rear of the block on the driver's side, just ahead of where the bell housing attaches. On 350 engines for 1970, 71, and many 72s, the casting number is 3970010. 454 engines have a different number, most commonly 3963512 for 1970, as shown in the manual. On the opposite side of the block is the casting date. The date consists of a letter and three numbers. The letter represents the month. Per the manual, the letters start at the beginning of the year, so A is January. The first two numbers represent the day and the last number represents the year. Our replacement block is a J159. This means it was cast on October 15th of 1969. Moving to the front of the engine block, there is a machine service pad located on the right hand side. On this pad is stamped the engine assembly date, suffix code, and serial number derivative. Towards the top side of the pad is the assembly stamping. This was stamped on the pad at the engine assembly plant. There are several letters and numbers that make this up, so let's break it down for a 350 engine. The first letter is either a V or a T, which represents the plant the engine was built in. The V stands for Flint. Not sure how that was determined, but I'm sure there's an explanation somewhere. The T stands for Tonawanda. The next four numbers are the engine assembly date. Ours is a 1028, which means October 28th of 1969. This date precedes the assembly of the car, which was March 18th of 1970. In general, if the date is not more than six months prior to the assembly date, then is considered correct. However, it is common for the dates to be much closer together. The last three letters are the engine broadcast code. As I mentioned earlier, this is a replacement engine, so our broadcast code is incorrect. We have an HY, which is actually a 1969 Corvette engine. Had this been the correct LT1 engine, the broadcast code would have been CTK. Looking at the manual, the various broadcast codes are noted for the different types of engines. For 1970 and 72, they are completely different codes, so refer to the manual. Towards the bottom of the engine pad is a VIN derivative. This was stamped on the engine during production of the car. If we had the correct engine, the VIN derivative would have been 70S407067. The 70 means it's from 1970. The S stands for the St. Louis plant, and the remaining digits are the serial number of the car, so it should match the VIN certification label. Last, let's look at the carburetor. Having the correct carburetor is important due to the amount of judging deductions there are with it. A whopping 60 total deductions are associated with the carburetor, 38 for originality and 22 for condition. There are two options for carburetors in 1970. Rochester and Holly. All LT1 Corvettes came with a Holly carburetor. Important numbers for the Holly carburetor are the list number and metering block numbers. 
for our LT1, the list number is 4555, and the metering blocks are 6333 and 4519. From the manual, you can see all the numbers for the different carburetors. If you don't have the correct carburetor, you certainly can obtain it. However, getting one with the correct numbers and date code can sometimes be quite pricey. So make sure you factor that into your restoration cost if the original is long gone. So those are the most important numbers on the car. If these are correct for your Corvette, you are off to a great start in your restoration. So I've been saying that our project car is an LT1. Since we don't have the original engine with the CTK broadcast code, how are we certain it is an LT1? Well, for this particular car, I would say there could be some debate. Other than the broadcast code, there are six things that can identify a Corvette as an LT1. These are all different from the standard Corvette. The first and most notable difference is in the hood. An LT1 hood has a center raised section similar to the big block engine, but there is a thin double striped graphic wrapping around this raised area with LT1 inscripted on each side. When our Corvette was purchased, a standard Corvette hood was installed, which did appear to be an original 1970 hood. Strike one. Next up is the fuel line from the tank to the engine. An LT1 only has a single fuel line to the fuel pump. There is no return line like the base Corvette. What did we originally have? A supply line and return line. Strike two. The third difference is the tachometer red line. An LT1 red line is 6,500 RPM on the tach gauge versus the base model, which is 5,500 RPM. We had minimal interior on the car, including the gauges, so this one is non-conclusive. On the console of all 1970s is a trim plate that indicates the engine horsepower, cubic inches, torque, and compression ratio. For an LT1, it should read 370 horsepower, 350 cubic inches, 380 foot-pounds of torque, and an 11 to 0 to 1 compression ratio. Again, we had no console plate in the car, so another maybe, maybe not. The exhaust system on an LT1 is two and a half inch diameter pipes versus the two inch for the base model. As you can imagine, we had a replacement exhaust, which is two inch diameter. Strike three. The last difference is the TI ignition system, which was only on the LT1. No surprise that with the replacement engine, we would not have the somewhat complicated TI ignition. This is where things get a little fuzzy and continues our story on how we went from a resto mod to an NCRS restoration. In the front driver's side wheel well are three holes, midway up on the front side. This location happens to be where the TI ignition module is attached to the car on an LT1. These three holes on the car match up perfectly with the TI ignition. Does that make this an LT1? Could the holes have been accidentally drilled in the factory? It is entirely possible. We will never know if this is truly original LT1 Corvette, and even though we are restoring it to be an LT1, it should always be portrayed that it may not truly be an LT1, which is the correct thing to do. The big problem, and one I do get concerned about, is in 30 years, whoever may own the car, will they know it may not be an LT1. Some of you, I'm sure, will not agree with our determination, and I totally understand. But in the NCRS judging world, an older Corvette such as this, with no documentation on what the car really is, is judged as presented. And it will never truly be an LT1 without the correct LT1 power plant. So that concludes our LT1 story and the basic numbers on a 1970 Corvette. Use this information to start your journey on restoring your Corvette to the NCRS standards. Thanks for watching our first episode of the NCRS Insider. If you enjoyed what we had to offer, please hit the subscribe button below so you don't miss a single episode. In our January 15th episode, we're going to take a look at the Corvettes displayed at the 2023 Corvettes at Carlisle NCRS Gallery. See you then.